Thank you so much. So, all right, y'all, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I know it's a Wednesday night. I got kids in the background wanting me to go spoil them and take care of them. So wanted to definitely thank you all again for coming in here today. Um, you know, it's not not easy when it's a Wednesday night at 630. So I definitely want to be aware and respectful of your time. Uh, but thank you so much for coming and checking out uh, my market timing strategy. Uh Ultimately, going to be talking about 30, 40 minutes here. Uh, definitely want to open it up for some questions here at the end. So, of course, you know, feel free to stop me at any time, but I'm going to go ahead and run with this and go ahead and get into a little bit about the strategy tonight. So, without further ado, I got a little bit of an agenda here. So, let me go ahead and get into it. So, ultimately, you know, many, many people who are on the call today, know me in some regards, many of you don't. Uh, so I definitely want to provide a little bit of some background uh, just so you can ultimately understand really who I am, what my firm is a little bit about. Uh, after we talk about that for uh, probably about 15, 20, 30, 40 minutes, uh, we'll go ahead and get into what I really focus on with my firm, and that's the power of thinking differently. Um, you know What I'll tell you most the way that I look at things is if we want to achieve what the herd is achieving, then we we need to think like them. But if we want to achieve something a little bit more and go a little bit beyond, we got to think differently and try to either be ahead uh, or forecast things that are really going to help us out so we can outperform over the long term. And then, of course, you know, ultimately, if you have uh, some interest in this kind of strategy and you want to learn more about it, or even if you think this is a good fit and you want to get started, I'm going to talk a little bit about how you actually get invested into it. So let me go ahead and jump into a little bit of background of me. So as you can tell, look a little bit like the picture here. Yeah, I shaved a little bit this evening. So um, ultimately, who is Corey Schrader? And we're going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to share a little bit about my background. Uh, I believe it's a little bit unique, and I think it really plays into how I view things and how I manage money for my clients. And then I want to talk a little bit about what is Black Creek management? How is it different than others? Uh, why is there a Black Creek wealth management? And ultimately, why it should even matter to you? Uh, and maybe it shouldn't. But ultimately, let me go ahead and jump in on who I am and, and ultimately what I am. So let me go ahead and start off with just a little bit of a story. So many people uh, who know me know that I've come from not much when it comes by way of my background. My parents was, my mom was a bookkeeper. My dad was a service writer for Cadillac. Uh, like many people nowadays, you know, we grew up on hamburger helper. We grew up on tater tots and chicken fingers on Fridays and the occasional birthday, we'd go to like the Olive Garden. So it really didn't come up with uh, any sort of heavy financial background. My parents didn't know how to manage money. They didn't have money. Uh, there wasn't a lot of just money in the family. So as I was progressing throughout my college career, ultimately they wanted me to go to college and you know, they did everything they could to ensure that I could actually go to college. Well, once I got to college, I decided, hey, I don't know if this is the right fit for me. So I, being who I am, had to pave my own way and ultimately decided that college was not for me uh, and decided to go with what I knew. And what I knew at the time was the restaurant industry, because as many people know, and if you've been in the restaurant industry, that you can make money fast and you can ultimately just go in, do your job and go home. Really, it's that simple. But really it was the money that really attracted me. If you're a server, if you're a cook, you can make some good, a good living. Well, ultimately I was doing that for a little while, uh, was working, I don't know if many of you know what Planet Hollywood is, but Planet Hollywood is in Orlando. Well, I was working at, the usual places like Red Lobster, Olive Garden, all these kind of things. And ultimately figured I'm doing pretty good at this stuff. Let me go ahead and up my game. And I want to go ahead and go to culinary school because why not be a chef, right? Let's go ahead and try to make a little bit of some extra money and do those kind of things. So I went to culinary school, was went through it all, you know, did pretty well through it, decided I was going to go ahead and run kitchens for a living. Well, got the opportunity to run two kitchens out of Planet Hollywood. We were doing about two and a half million dollars a week in food. So really just cranking, going, going, going. 
during this period, uh, I got married, uh, ended up marrying Melissa, my wife, and we decided that I was going to continue this career. Well, my father-in-law came down and said, hey, Corey, I got a quick question for you. I'm like, okay, what's, what's on your mind? He says, well, you're working at Planet Hollywood. You're clearly grinding it out. What is, how much are you making and how much time are you spending at that place? Well, I was getting up at six in the morning, leaving there at 12 at night, and then rinse and repeat. So I was there about 80, 90 hours a week. Well, he said to me, he goes, how much you make and doing all that? It's like, I was making about 35, thought I was, you know, doing pretty good. He looks at me, he goes, Corey, he goes, this is not good, man. This is not good. You're grinding yourself out. He goes, I have an idea for you. You ever thought about moving up to Jacksonville and maybe trying something different, maybe even trying to work for me? Why don't you come up? I'll teach you how to be a residential appraiser and... Ultimately, we'll we'll see how that plays out for a while. Well, one of the things that my father always ingrained in me um, was really the concept of work smarter, not harder. So why wouldn't it make sense, right? I'm going to be able to make similar money and work less by working for my father-in-law and appraising residential properties. Now, he was doing commercial and residential at the time. So he just wanted me just to jump into real estate. So this was around 2005. I moved up to Jacksonville, got out of the restaurant industry, was the best choice I had at the time. And from there was a residential appraiser. Well, I was working under him for a while, working with investors, working with banks, analyzing markets, doing economic things that using my mind versus my body, which I absolutely loved. Well, what happened in 2007, 2008? Well, it wasn't good time for a residential appraiser. Uh, basically my father-in-law looks at me and says, Hey, Corey rats off the ship. Um, I'm sorry, but I can't support you anymore. Well, the reason that was, is because we were using, uh, appraisal management companies in, in certain banks, uh, that we were making $300 in appraisal prior to 2008. And then appraisal management companies had to come in and work between us and, and brokers. And now the fees drop from 300 to $125. So he couldn't support me. So thinking differently, as I often do, I'm like, okay, well, my father-in-law can do it. I could probably pull this off. So I went ahead and I opened up appraisals by Corey in 2000, uh, late 2007, and then started tapping into all of my, my bank uh, connections, talked to the appraisal management companies. But the problem was, is I was moving from $300 in appraisal to about 125 so Corey had to get a second job. <laughs> so unfortunately, uh, that's where I had to go back into the restaurants. So now I'm doing residential appraising. I'm working back in the restaurants at Applebee's here in Jacksonville. And one of my friends came over to me and she's like, hey, she goes, weren't you working with investors and doing some sort of finance and such? I'm like, well, yeah, absolutely. She goes, have you ever thought about coming to work at Fidelity? I'm like, well, I never thought about it, but honestly, I'm all about it. You know, for me, I'm always of the mindset, again, work smarter, not harder. Is there a better way to do what I'm doing? And ultimately, I had a one-year-old at the time. So if I'm going to make more money and I'm going to be able to, you know, use my mind again and not use my body in the restaurant, why not? Let's go ahead and take advantage of that. So from this story, if you're gathering... I wasn't afraid to fail quickly with what I was doing or change and navigate based off of some potential changes that I believed were going to be better for me and my family. So ultimately, as I'm thinking through all of this, I get into Fidelity. And as I said, I went to college, but I really moved out of college. So I never got my degree. Well, once I got hired into Fidelity, it was like putting gasoline on a fire. I was working with investors. I was talking to them about financial planning. I was talking to them about stocks and all the things that really interest me. So of course, on my own dime, I went ahead, went back to college, got my uh, bachelor's in finance and financial services. Uh, and then from there, moved on and got my chartered, excuse me, I got my certified financial planning designation, which is of course a fiduciary designation. Uh, and then I was working with clients doing planning, but really decided that I wanted to manage money for folks. I wanted to do better. For whatever reason, I felt like I had a different purview or a different, had different view. I'd listen to mutual fund managers come down from Boston and they talk about 
all these analysis and all these things that they were seeing. And, you know, there was a saying that used to come about is, is you can be right longer than your solvent, right? So, hey, I believe the market's going to fall. We're going to drop by 30%, but it never happens. And you keep with that, that mindset, that uh, hypothesis, and you never really shift or adjust or change. Well, I always felt like, okay, I need to know more. So I went from there. I moved into the, the management group at Fidelity and was working with clients, doing investment profile statements, talking about asset allocation, building portfolios, and decided to go after my chartered financial analyst designation so I could actually manage money professionally. So took it from there and, and decided, all right, now I've gotten my charter financial analyst designation. I got my CFP, my uh, certified financial planner. I want to go out and I want to actually manage money for clients. So I went ahead and I joined a firm here in Jacksonville, was managing $250 million, uh, building out asset allocations, building out investment strategies, uh, came up with the actual strategy that I'm going to talk about tonight. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. Uh, but the thought was, is I want to go and I want to actually manage actual money. Well, my timing was impeccable. This was back in 2017. Well, what happened in 2019? COVID, right? Managing $250 million, market drops 30% in two weeks. A little bit stressful, right? Good news is, is we were able to rebalance, get things out of it, came out of it stronger than when we went into it. But it helped me understand, okay, what was the reach that I had with these clients? At the same time, as I was working with this firm, the owner unfortunately passed away. Well, prior to that, uh, he had sat me down in his office and he says, hey, Corey, you know, at any time, if you want, you know, you could always go do this on your own. We know that, you know, we appreciate you here and we want to keep you here, but just know that you're doing a great job. And, you know, ultimately these strategies you're coming up with, you could always do them on your own. Well, unfortunately he passed away in 2019 and that's when, I said, you know what? It's time to actually unleash this firm, Black Creek Wealth Management, to Jacksonville and anyone else who wants to have a personal relationship. So what is Black Creek Wealth Management? Well, Black Creek Wealth Management is the culmination of what I've been building for over the last five to 10 years. Is I was working with $250 million, working with 200 plus clients. Going through COVID, trying to have a personal relationship with all those people is just not possible. You just don't have the bandwidth, let alone the ability to, to create unique strategies that really are specific to those individuals. And I wanted to change that. So that's why I've built out Black Creek Wealth, is I want all the clients that I work with to not only have a good cost benefit, you know, not have high fees, not have high internal costs, but also get more out of what they're actually trying to do by us thinking differently and building things around them versus their risk tolerance. And of course, why should it matter? Well, ultimately, I want to see people succeed. I want to see people get from A to B as quickly and safely as possible through looking at risk a different way. So just to, again, go back to me and my firm just for a quick second before we move on here. So ultimately, 17 years of experience, been doing this for a very long time, five years direct trading money management, managed that through COVID, uh, talked about these unique strategies. Well, during COVID, actually right before it, I started working more closely with the chartered market technician uh, uh, designation. Really, I always heard, you know, hey, technical analysis is everything. Uh, you can figure out different ways to get in and out of things. You can day trade, you can do all these things. So it was, to me, it was a bunch of voodoo, but I really wanted to understand just like anyone who sits at a poker table, hey, if I know what everybody else is thinking, what kind of moves can I make? So I wanted to learn what they were actually doing and how to take advantage of it. So as I was going through and building out these strategies, I was building out spread strategies, building out option strategies. Uh, and really fine-tuned it down to the actual strategy that I'm going to be talking about today. So again, just a couple of highlights. Firm was created back in 2021, right after uh, COVID and everything, basically focusing on people over profits. And I really want to just make sure that all of the clients I work with have a customized investment approach. So that's where that is. So I've been talking about thinking differently, and I really lean on this quote. So 
if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. What do I mean by that? Well, what does he mean by that? Well, if we're constantly looking at things the way that your average money manager looks at it from a risk analysis perspective, most of the time we're all looking in the rearview mirror to drive forward. There's a reason that our What's, what's the word I'm looking for? There's a reason our uh, front windshield is way bigger than our uh, rear view mirror, right? We need to be aware of what's going on in the past, but we need to also be looking ahead to better understand our environment. Well, if we're constantly looking behind us and using that risk analysis to try to forecast what's going forward, we may miss things. I mean, let's look at what happened last year. Economists most of them, if not 90% of them, were wrong. They said we were going into recession. They said we weren't going to be able to sustain these incredible rate, uh, you know, and that's yet to be determined, but they said it was going to happen last year. So if we're all looking at things the same way, how are we all benefiting or how are we taking advantage? So that's why I like this quote. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that power of thinking differently. So I want to do a little bit of a synopsis on how do markets do over time, again, from my perspective. I really like the concentration versus diversification conversation because I really, really feel like a lot of people should know more about this. Uh, rule of 72, if you're not familiar with what that is, I'm going to talk about it and I'm going to talk about how we can think about that a little bit differently. And then, of course, my personal favorite is, Corey, if market timing does not work, why are you even advertising that you can do it? So I want to show a little bit about that. Again, talking about how we think about things differently. So not going to belabor this, but definitely want to talk about how do markets do over the time. So on the left, you're going to see all the various market drops, peak to trough, in their drawdowns, how far they went over that time period. Um, ultimately, when we've run this analysis, the S&P 500, uh, which is what's being shown here, has returned about 13% over the last 10 years on an annual basis, and about 10% over the last 20, 20 years, right? It's not too bad. That's actually pretty, pretty good. As most people say, hey, I, I, you know, six to eight, seven to 9% is really worth the bogey is shooting for. Well, okay, the S&P 500, which most people don't jump into, has returned much higher, right? So if we look at these drawdowns, the biggest thing that I always like to look at is, is okay, we always have these things called recency biases, right? So let's go back to COVID. COVID dropped uh, a good amount, dropped out about 20%. So anytime the market fluctuates here over the next couple of months and it drops, let's say one, two, 3%, what is the first thing we think about? We go back to 2018. Prior to 2018, we went back to 2008, right? Oh, this is the doomsday market. This is the way things are gonna, are gonna go. Well, to be honest with you, this is 73 years of data going from 1950 up until last year, and the market has only declined 20% 12 times. Let that sink in for a second. If we've had 70 plus years of data, right, looking in the rearview mirror again, and only 12 times it's been down 20% or more, Markets tend to do pretty well over time. This is the argument around passive investing, right? If you can just keep your mind quiet and just ride those waves, the market will be okay. You know, did an analysis a couple of years ago uh, and updated it again last year, but somebody else did it as well to see what the index, the S&P 500 index fluctuates on any given day. And over time, if you love your probability distributions, here's what they look like you'll see that the market moves on average about one, you know, up 1%, down 1% the majority of the time. This is a normal probability distribution. But what do we all care about? We care about the tail risks, right? So, and the tail risks are when you get out in this area. Let me go ahead and actually go back. So if we go back and let me just do a little laser pointer here. So, you know, we're worried about this, right? The market fell 7% in one day. We're not too happy about this, but we're sure happy if the market's up 5% in one day, right? So for the majority of the time, when you look at these drawdowns, right? Nobody likes to sit within these, but you'll notice over the years that it really only takes maybe three to six months on average. Of course, you got some outliers here, but if you take the median and the mean, 
you're somewhere right around six months to a year of recovery time. So that tells me that most times you see trending markets. Um, you don't really see a lot of these huge swings. We just happen to focus on them because those are bad events and we really don't like them, right? So over time, markets tend to do pretty well with these intermittent drops over time. But what I tended to notice is as we continue to get more and more in this age of fast trading and algorithmic trading and such, the markets are coming back much, much quicker, right? We saw technology pop up in 2000, but for the most part, these big swings in 11 and 18, they've come back relatively quick. So again, we need to be aware of those things. Not that they're going to happen again, but are we being a little too nervous when it comes down to how the markets do? All right. So I want to talk about the concept of concentration versus diversification. Um, I'm not smart enough to have come up with this saying, but it's something that lives in my heart here recently is you get wealthy through concentration, you stay wealthy through diversification. Let me say that one more time. You get wealthy through concentration, you stay wealthy through diversification, right? So anyone who bought Apple in 2000 at $20 a share and bought 2000 shares or 100 shares can absolutely attest to this conversation. You know, because... Ultimately, with all the splits and everything, if they've been holding it from the last 23 years, those 100 shares are now probably 1,500, 2,000 shares. Look at what's going on with NVIDIA. Look at what's going on with Google. I mean, you can even argue Bitcoin at this point, right? Well, some of the pros with concentration, of course, are your returns are going to compound, right? Look at what NVIDIA did last year. It was up 200%. It's up another, what, 25% this month, Okay. That's immense wealth building, right? It just compound, 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 right? It's less to monitor. You don't have to worry about fixed income. You don't have to worry about commodities. You don't have to worry about all these different things that everyone says you need to have. You just know what you know. Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's best friend, unfortunately just passed away. He was a huge proponent of this because if you know the company, why don't you just put everything you have into it because you know what it's going to do, right? Less the monitor. Complete focus and understanding. I think this is a little bit of a misleading comment. It is complete focus, but do you really understand everything about the business? Maybe, maybe not, but you're definitely going to have a, an upper leg on anyone who's just happened to buy and sell it on a whim, right? So you're going to have a little bit more of a benefit there. Now, some of the cons is, of course, you're completely subjected to price movement. Look at what's going on with Tesla right now, right? Of course, they have the issues. Of course, it's called idiosyncratic risk or company-specific risk where they're having to reprice cars. They're having issues in China. You're subjected to that one stock. So if it goes to the moon, you're having a great day. If it goes to the sewer, you're having a bad day. So that is a little bit of the cons. And of course, timing is everything, right? Let's say you believe that NVIDIA is doing extremely well, but all of a sudden they report next week and it drops from 650 down to 500. Now you're subjected to that poor timing, may not be a good company in the next three to six months, but long-term, everyone has NVIDIA chips in their computer. So timing may be off, right? So from a concentration perspective, you know, someone in retiring uh, or about to retire in at or near retirement might have a little bit of a problem with this concentration, but someone who's there might love diversification, right? All right, now I've made a million dollars or two million dollars, and I want to make sure that I don't lose it all, right? Well, again, diversification is helps you keep your wealth because now instead of being all in one index, it's up 23 or down 18%, like the SP has been over the last two years. Now you're in small cap, mid cap, international, real estate. So your hope is, is that the correlations uh, are not aligned. So correlations, if you don't know, basically move together like two dolphins in and out of the water. If you have a correlation of one, they're moving together. Well, bonds and stocks typically try to keep a, not a negative correlation, but usually a zero correlation where one goes up, one goes down. Okay. So you want that when it happens, uh, you know, in retirement or you're trying to not feel the swings because maybe you're just done. Right. Well, 
Some of the cons with that, and I'm going to show a slide here in a second, is what I call return spread. I don't know if this is a term. I thought of it. So if someone else is out there using it, this is just what came to me. But return spread, uh, correlations may increase in global events. So when you need diversification the most and you're expecting them to do this, the markets both drop together. Look at what happened last year, right? If you had a 60-40 portfolio, 60 stocks, 40 bonds, you were really crushed because interest rates went up and people believe that the market was, actually it was the year prior to that, sorry, where everything dropped in 21. Was it 21? I don't know. You know what I'm talking about. Ultimately, where both the markets went down, and usually this even happened in 2008, where everyone just sold bonds, everyone sold everything. Cash was the outperforming asset of 2008. So when you need those correlations, sometimes they align. And when you don't want them to, sometimes they move together. So that's the biggest issue with diversification um, when you have those big global events. The other part is, is you're aiming for market averages, right? It takes a village to build these out. If you only have 50% in the S&P 500 and it returns 7%, well, that's only 3.5%. Well, if your bogey is 8%, um, where are you going to get the rest of those returns? You need it from real estate. You need it from commodities. Maybe you have Bitcoin. Maybe you have crypto, whatever it is but you're going to need more of those things in order to get your market averages. So there's some challenges there. And that's where this, what I call the good old quilt chart, as many people know who are in the industry, quilt chart just shows the assets over time and ultimately how they've performed. So this gray here is your asset allocation, okay? Large cap, usually your S&P 500, internationals, your EFA, small caps, and correspondingly so. Well, if you come down here and you look, the S&P 500 index has a best year of 32%, worst year of 18, down 18, over the last, I think this is, what, 14 years, right? So your annual is about 14%, okay, on the S&P 500. Well, if you're not concentrated in that, right, your asset allocation portfolio, which is about a 60-40 portfolio, which most advisors out there try to recommend or get people into, well, you're getting almost half, a little bit more than half of the return. Your best is still a little bit lower, but your worst, you're only off by one and a half percent, even on the worst. So is the really the standard deviation and risk trade-off, are you getting what you're expecting to get from that diversification? I don't know. Let's look at it. So I want to talk about the rule of 72. So if you're not familiar, the rule of 72 is this. So whatever your annual interest rate is, if you divide that by 72, that is going to tell you how many number of years. Actually, I think it's, give me one second. So yeah, the rule of 72 is this. So you divide 72 by whatever the actual interest rate is, and that will tell you how many years it takes for you to double your money. So I apologize. So you take 72, you take your interest rate, and then that's how many years it takes for you to double your money, right? Well, if your average client that is sitting with these um, advisors or money managers and they're shooting for the market averages, right? They're not trying to rock the boat. They're trying to create a, uh, a level, comfortable environment for everybody, right? I worked for Fidelity. They do not try to do anything unique. Listen, it's asset allocation. Here's what you're going to get. Averages, 6 to 8%, 79% if you're overly aggressive. But it's going to take you... If you go look on the left here, if you're getting seven and a half percent in a 60 40 portfolio, it's going to take you almost 10 years to double your money, right? Well, if you're trying to build wealth, it's going to take you a really, really long time to do that. I mean, it just is. Well, if you look at the large cap area, right, 14% over the last 15 years, you almost cut that time to double your money in half, right? Well, that's where the concept of concentration comes in. If you're diversified, maybe you don't need to make more money. Maybe you're not trying to build wealth. Okay, that's great. But maybe you are trying to have some spending money. Maybe you want to build a little bit wealth or legacy for your kids like I'm trying to do. I, I want to do better than what the market averages are getting because I know we can. If there's enough people out there doing it, hedge funds, um, you know, trying to push the envelope, how can we do it? without us taking on a tremendous amount of risk and overexposure. Well, let me go ahead and introduce you 
to the market timing strategy that I do for folks, okay? This is the whole thought of market timing, okay? Over the last couple of slides, I was just illustrating, you know, markets trend. Market timing, the way I look at this strategy and the way I run it is a trend following strategy. And I'm gonna show you here in a second what that looks like. But the concept is, is market timing can and does work. It's just a matter of what are your expert expectations, right? So when we look at this, I'm going to go ahead and try to move my face out of the way. I hope I'm not in the way here. So on the right here, what you'll see is the performance of the strategy over the last 10 months. Okay. So here's what the actual strategy returned on a monthly basis. Okay. Here's what the benchmark is. And the benchmark here is the S&P target risk aggressive. And what that is, excuse me, is 80% equities, 20% cash. So, with this strategy, I look to use less than the full amount of the actual account. So what do I mean by that? So over the last 10 months, and even now, I've used on average about 60% of the account. So if you had a $1,000 account, I'm using about $600 of that. Or if it's $100,000, I'm using about $60,000 of that account to generate this 18% return on a gross basis. So you have a lot that's in cash. So ultimately your whole account isn't feeling the overall fluctuation. Now, sometimes I'll hit 80%, sometimes I'll have 20% in the account. And what I typically do is, is when I can expand, I'll expand and when I can contract, I can contract. So the whole concept is, is with the overall benchmark, how are we doing? This is this middle column just tells me over time, how did I do on a monthly basis relative to this S&P target risk aggressive portfolio? Well, as you can see cumulatively over the month, and again, this is on a gross return, not net of the fee or the expense ratio, it's returned about 18.36%. Well, over the same time period, you can see that the S&P 500 was up 17.5%. Okay, so let me say that again. The strategy was up 18. The market or S&P 500 was up 17.5%. This is using on average 60% capital or 60% of the account. So over the last 10 months, and I can even attest to this, I did this through COVID with my own money. It does in fact work. The thing about how I like to look at this is, is how do I make more with less? So let me just show you what I look at on a daily basis to try to navigate and do this market timing, okay? So many of you may have seen this before, many of you may not, uh, but the concept is, is I use all kinds of different indicators analysis to actually find out when I can expand and contract. Now, this is the S&P 500, which I use um, for a portion of it, um, but I use various ETFs in order to pull off this strategy at any given time. But what I'm looking for is, is okay, what is the signals? What is momentum telling me? How can I get in and out and be able to expand the actual concentration of my position when I can, and then when things pivot or momentum slows down, how do I contract so that way I'm only in 20% of the market when the market drops? Because I wanna take advantage of this on the way up, but I wanna make sure that I also take advantage of this on the way down. So I'm able to move in and out of different things and go long when I need to, and even go short when I need to. So as I said before, one of the things I look at is, is Momentum is my friend and it's your friend as well, because ultimately when you look at what happened last year, if you were trying to look at the markets and say, oh, it's just a matter of time before it drops. Well, there was an upward momentum throughout the entire year, even with the 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 three big peaks and valleys that we saw. If I go back and show you, you know, market was going down here. But if you were to look at the monthly we were still in an uptrend regardless of what was going on. We were just retracing some of the COVID uh, overzealousness that was going on. So by using that, you can say, hey, where are we really at? 
And if I do need to contract, I can do that and still wait. And then now I'm being patient and then I can deploy capital when I need to. So the other part of it is, again, like I said before, with concentration, it's less to monitor. I'm just looking at a broad base index. One of the beautiful things with the indexes is called survivorship bias. Who remembers um, Enron? Who remembers Kodak? Who remembers um, you know, uh, Lehman Brothers? These were companies that were in the indexes. Well, survivorship bias, all that says is that as all of this is happening, there's businesses that are failing, but they get removed out of the index and you continue to see this upward bias because all of those bad companies get removed from these indexes. So you see just a natural uh, lift to the markets. That's why when anyone tells me, hey, Corey, we should short the market, I always tell them, look, there's an upward bias. Take that into account with baby boomers, uh, politicians, a lot of different things that have a natural incentive to keep the markets higher. Look at what happened with SVB earlier last year. It was 75% of the size of the financial crisis in 2008. The government stepped in and bailed it out. Risk is, is, is becoming an interesting thing. So not to go on a tangent, but there's less to monitor. There's a, a, a natural inherent bias to the upside in these indexes. Uh, so again, complete focus and understanding. You know that these are the top companies. Typically, the top 10% typically run these indexes. So as long as those companies are doing well, you know what to look for. Uh, what I'm a fan of is, is that you can use a fraction of the account to beat the market and, of course, other investors, right? If I'm only using 60% of the account and getting market returns, what does that look like? I mean, that gives me the ability to, to leave a little bit of some cash in 5% and boost my yield, right? So you can do some creative things with it. Um, some of the cons, because there are some cons that comes with it, you are completely invested in one market. Uh, and ultimately, if you know Iran or somebody uh, does something unthinkable and tries to bomb us or you know, you have that tail risk event that happens um, and you're, you're, you have 80% that's invested, well, you are going to feel some of that because, again, you have that much that's invested. Now, if you had 20% invested, you probably won't feel it and you're probably like, okay, this is an opportunity to jump in and, you know, take advantage of it. But you do have that one that one concern that if you can't, you can't control everything. There's risk inherent with investing in anything. However, if that happens, you are subjected to it. Um, the other thing that I always let to, like to let everyone know about is there's a hurdle rate for investors, right? So the fund has an expense ratio or a management cost of 2.5% a year. Well, prior to this year, I was using it as a hedge fund. So I was actually charging 25% of profits. Well, with that, I could only do this strategy for certain folks. Well, I have a strong belief, again, with my firm, I want to focus on people over profits. So for me, I want to help folks, not to say that I'm not willing to help everybody, but I really want to make sure that everyone has access to this strategy. And honestly, most people can't do this kind of strategy because they don't qualify. I wanted to remove all hurdles from that and really help people build some wealth and help give them better options in the future. It's just my own personal mission. So again, we're getting kind of at the end here. So where can the strategy fit in? I love to use this with Roth accounts. So last year, like I said, it was up about 18%. Net, it was up about 15 Well, if you're over the age of 60 and you have a Roth account, let's say you've been able to put in $100,000 and you're now clipping out 15%, that's 15 grand after tax. It's a beautiful thing. Most people say you can only withdraw 4% 4 4 from your portfolio, right? Well, what if you have the ability to use a strategy like this that generates excessive returns in a tax-free account. You know, not only can you take money out, but you can build a, a good amount of wealth tax-free. I love, I love it in that that kind of account. Uh, as I was saying before, this could really be a good source for S and P 500 index exposure, right? Well, if this strategy is all about focusing on riding the wave when it goes up, and then contracting when it starts to peak over that wave, and then takes advantage of it on the way down. The goal here really is, is to try to be neutral when we need to be neutral and then take advantage of the shorts if we need to or go long when we need to, again, on the ups and the downsides, right? So really good uh, idea to use it there. And then, of course, you know, if you do have a diversified portfolio and you said, hey, 
I want to do something that's going to offset one of my biggest positions, which tends to be 10 to 15% in an index. You could use something like this that would have a negative correlation, again, not moving in line with it to help offset your portfolio risk. So there's some good options that comes with that. So in summary, I really wanted to thank all of you guys for, for coming out today. I hope this was really, if anything, a, a mind change in the sense of how can you think differently, or maybe you already think this way, and this is just a, a way to reaffirm what you're you're already thinking. But I wanted everyone to come today and get something to think about differently. And how do we just make more with less? And how do we just continually improve? So as I said before, if it's something that you're interested in and something that you wanted to maybe learn more about, or, hey, this makes sense for you. And you're like, you know what? I've been looking for something like this. Here's the steps that you can do to get more information or even go ahead and pull the trigger. So you can just email me at blackcreekwm at gmail.com. Tell me what the interest is. You know, if you want to learn more or if, hey, you're ready to get going, if you're ready to get going, I send you out my compliance information. It's a sign up process. We open up accounts. Uh, I tell you about what all that looks like. The minimum investment typically for hedge funds is way higher. I wanted to make it where it was digestible for everybody uh, that can really qualify. Most folks, if you're under 15, it's a little bit hard because I don't want this to be all of all of their money um, because again, risk is, is risk. So I've reduced it down to 15,000 from my prior minimums. Um, so, but once you're signed up, we fund the account, trading begins, we have a conversation, make sure that you know what's going on. But one of the things I always try to explain to everyone who works with me, whether it's traditional money management, whether it's this kind of strategy, whether it's financial planning, mostly for my, my investment management though, anyone who works with me gets a personal investment manager. Um, I am not taking on a tremendous amount of clients. In fact, I'm actually going to be closing down my book here soon because I've gotten a, a majority of my clients, but I want to do this strategy for everybody. I'm actually trying to turn this into a mutual fund. So anyone who works with me at this point gets a personal investment manager. Hey, Corey, I want to know how this strategy works. I want more details. You can pick up the phone and we can talk one-on-one -on -one and you are actually working with the person who's managing your money, not someone in Boston, Chicago, LA, someone who's actually managing your money. Uh, one of the beautiful things I love about this is you see all the trades real time. I get texts from my clients all the time. Hey, Corey, I saw this happen today. Hey, Corey, I saw this happen today. It's complete transparency. It's actually, I, I love that kind of interaction because we're, we're, we're moving together, right? You want to go fast, go by yourself. You want to go far, go with somebody, right? And then of course, my biggest thing that I love is, is it's a hedge fund strategy for a mutual fund cost that can service everybody. So ultimately, again, I just wanted to say thank you. I'm going to go ahead and pull off the microphone here. So if you have any questions, um, I'm going to go ahead and open up the chat here. Uh, and we'll take the next five, 10 minutes if you got anything. And I'd, I'd be happy to tell you, you know, and answer your questions. So let me go ahead and unmute everybody. All right. And if any, and again, if nobody has any questions or anything, perfectly okay. I know again, it's a Wednesday night um, and you can always uh, connect with me offline if you need to as well. But if you have anything, you know, feel free, let me know and I'll be happy to answer that for you. Hey, Corey, I'm, I wanted to ask in the strategy, do you focus on certain types of industry within the uh, S&P 500 or do you, you just use ETFs that follow the S&P itself, not specific industries? So great question. So depending on what's going on. So for instance, when you talk about industries, um, you know, some of the indexes I get into are like the Q's, QQQ, which is purely technology. Well, not purely, but mostly technology. Um, I do use a lot of fundamental analysis within the technical analysis that I'm using. So I'm looking at, you know, technology for one. If you look at the S&P 500, 30% of the companies are technology. So if, if the Q's aren't doing well, typically SPY is going to have a problem as well because you're going to have an anchor, right? Um, conversely, if the technology is doing really well, it's probably going to be 
an amazing balloon when it comes to the SPY. So I do look at various industries. Uh, and if there are specific ETFs that I can leverage to, again, get the same kind of returns, risk return trade-off, I'll absolutely do that. But I'm analyzing those those industries to see how that's going to react within the market. So yes. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. So. All right. Well, if there's no other questions, like I said, I'm going to go ahead and leave you to this uh, beautiful evening. Um, I don't know where everyone's at, but it's uh, it's no longer 30 degrees here in Jacksonville. So uh, again, thank you all for coming out. Really appreciate it. You know, have a blessed day. Again, if you do want to follow up uh, with anything, questions, concerns, thoughts, or even want to sign up, feel free to reach out to me. But again, thanks for coming out and have a blessed night. Talk to you soon.